Okay, I'll kick off. So good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this uh, first session of the morning uh, after the, uh, the cocktail reception last night. It's, uh, I appreciate it. Um, I'm Tim Morton. I'm founder and CTO at Akunu. I'm going to talk to you a little bit this morning about NoSQL and uh, big data analytics. So NoSQL's role in uh, how you analyze data. It's all very well collecting data or using NoSQL solutions to serve it, but where it gets really interesting, in my opinion, is when you start doing something with that data, when you start synthesizing it, summarizing it, or processing it in some way to extract business value. Um, so just to give you a, a couple of sentences about Akunu. So uh, we're a company that uh, provides solutions around real-time uh, analytics, so in particular, streaming analytics. We provide um, software that allows you to build OLAP cubes on top of NoSQL. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, what I'm really going to cover in this, this talk is a history and a taxonomy of how analytics arrived in NoSQL. Um, my background, I actually started working with, I guess, what you would call NoSQL uh, during my PhD at, at Cambridge. So I was part of the project which built the Zen virtualization platform. And as part of that, we uh, looked a lot at how you manage storage in distributed systems, and in particular, in wide area distributed systems. So I actually did some work. Uh, this was probably back in 2001, 2002, where we were uh, developing the sort of very first generation of uh, wide area distributed hash tables. And uh, those were the systems that went on to influence Dynamo and Cassandra and the design of many of the sort of current generation of NoSQL systems that uh, are commercially available today. Um, so I, I guess the interesting thing there is that, you know, um, back when we were doing that, we weren't really sure what the use cases were. That's research, right? You sort of do it and you justify the, the use cases as you go. But it's great to see that sort of technology actually uh, having real business application these days. And so I'm going to take you through a, a bit of the history about, uh, about those systems and how, uh, how, in particular, analytics has arrived there. This is the first talk in, a, in the day of a track of talks around analytics. So hopefully it will do a little to sort of set the stage if you're planning to go to a few of those talks later. So I think in the beginning, um, as I alluded to, you know, for, from the research angle, NoSQL is mainly about storage. If you look here at the abstract of the big table paper published by uh, Google in 2006, actually, um, the, the, the stuff that they were talking about was really uh, how do you collect data, uh, data with some structure to it, and how do you then go and build a system that serves that data back out? So analytics really wasn't a key part of the consideration. The consideration was, how do you deal with these volumes of data? How do you deal with these very, very large collections of data? So although the data that we're talking about is data which has some structure to it, this isn't really the domain of conventional databases. In particular, conventional databases uh, have a lot of, offer a lot of features around um, making guarantees about the transactional integrity of your data. That's great if what you're doing is financial transaction processing. But if you're merely collecting data or serving it back out and not really manipulating it, then those, those things are unnecessary. So I guess the observation and the, yeah, the key observation, really, about systems like Bigtable is that what you can do is drop those transactional semantics and get scale. So you move from the world of a scale-up architecture to a scale-out architecture by offering uh, weaker semantics, which is fine for this particular this particular domain. And that also applies to other similar systems that were around at the same time. So for example, Amazon Dynamo, where the sort of canonical use case was around uh, managing shopping carts. And that's, that's quite interesting. So to go into that in a bit more detail, I'll sort of look at one of the examples from the Big Table paper, which was around offering personalized search. So Google built a system which allowed your search results to be customized through information about uh, clicks that you'd been making on Google, previous searches that you'd, you'd, you'd done. If you look at what was happening here, they used Bigtable to collect these streams of user queries and clicks and uh, organize them into a store. So at that, at that point, nothing was being done with that data. It was just sitting there. Then an out-of-band analytics process implemented via MapReduce, which took the underlying storage 
uh, files that were sitting in, 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 in Bigtable stored in GFS, which is the equivalent of HDFS inside Google, were pushing, were basically taking that raw data, doing some analytics on it, and then pushing it back into a separate table in the same Bigtable cluster to go and serve. So what you've got there is a system which is explicitly saying analytics is not in the domain of NoSQL. Quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting separation there. And why, why were they doing that? Well, in this particular use case, um, there, there isn't particular deep value in the timeliness of answers. But that's obviously not always, always, always true for many of the problems that we see um, as users in the NoSQL domain. So one of, the interesting, uh, one of the interesting, I guess, distinctions to make, or one of the interesting distinctions that I find is, is very useful to think about in terms of the problems that you're trying to solve, is when, uh, what, what sort of analytics you're really trying to do. So, you know, big data in particular is closely associated with uh, Hadoop. Hadoop being uh, the sort of open source variant of MapReduce. And for those, uh, for those problem domains, you're really talking about collecting a large amount of data and then mining it after the fact to try and draw out the so-called unknown unknowns or the needles in a haystack around uh, the insight that could, over the long term, inform business decisions that you're making. So it's typically a great setup for doing uh, arbitrary, complex analysis on unstructured data. On the other hand, more the preserve of original databases and the sort of everyday line of business and analytical applications that enterprises have been building on SQL databases for years is what really gets called operational intelligence. So here we're talking about how do we do reporting, especially real-time reporting, how do we build dashboards, how do we provide the data that's necessary for applications or humans to be making real-time decisions or raising alerts so that people can act on them where timeliness matters. So where there is a business decision that could be taken better on the basis of fresh information or where there is something that has gone wrong and you'd like to be able to take corrective action to improve that. And you see what we're really doing here is working more on the left-hand side on data at rest more on the right-hand side at de on data in motion. So we're dealing with data that we've collected and perhaps have archived over a while. And on the right-hand side, we're dealing with streams of data. And if you want to think of it in terms of the Vs, I guess on the left-hand side, you're potentially dealing more with uh, variety. And on the right-hand side, more with velocity. And of course, the key, con the key concerns about data volume and the inherent value of the data, being able to provide an economic solution for the amount of data that you're needing to process, are concerns across, across the board. Um, so I'm going to really focus in this talk more on the right-hand side, because that is where NoSQL has really found a home in the analytics space. So if you look at, I'll, I'll go on to show you some of these systems and solutions that are out there. Um, if you look at where NoSQL has got deployed for analytics use cases, it's much more around the operational intelligence side. And that is really because NoSQL, from the beginning, even when it was a storage solution, was looking to tackle the uh, data sets with some structure to them. That structure being the key, uh, the key facet which allows you to go in and get, do random access on your data and pick out individual, individual results in the same way that traditional databases can do. Um, but I guess as a sort of significant distinction and big departure from traditional databases, um, we, we, we aren't providing, um, I guess, in, in the NoSQL world, often full norm normalization of data. So if you think about what happens in a database, you build a relational schema which fully um, normalizes the data and, and organizes constraints between uh, various different categories of data that you're working with. So that has some, some, some great features. It means that, uh, in particular, you can build uh, languages, so, so languages like SQL, so query processing languages on top, which are tied tightly to the, to the storage. So that gives you great flexibility in the questions that you're going to ask. Um, but it also means that you end up doing a lot of work to answer those questions uh, at, if you, when you're dealing with very large data sets. 
So if you consider a setup where you are processing a stream of events, say, for example, uh, a stream of tweets, often it's machine-generated data or you know, sort of exhaust data of some sort, for every update, you might only do a few random writes. You're, you're updating data and you're updating uh, indexes, but those might be spread across different machines, the, certainly different places on your disk. The challenge really comes when you're trying to make a query. So if I were to build something like Twitter in a fully normalized relational database, I would be doing a lot of random access and building, uh, doing a lot of work to try and pull back all of that data from, uh, from across my database as I went. And that is, that, is, that is quite a challenging situation if what you're trying to deliver to your users is a low latency experience. So what we found often in the NoSQL world is there is this, this that, we, that we have this, um, we, we adopt this idea of denormalization. So denormalization is where you think carefully about the way that data is gonna be read back in advance and you write data according to those patterns. And it is something that has been around for a long while in the relational world, but has always been frowned upon as we'll, as we'll, we'll come to see. But it's, um, it, it, it goes a little bit like this. So you potentially take an event, you think, how is that update going to be accessed later? So my tweets might appear in many, many users' tweet streams. The update could do potentially many writes, but the advent of new storage technology and the sort of characteristics of uh, disks as, as uh, a few years ago as they, as they changed means that storage capacity is cheap. Sequential I.O. is cheap, but random access, in particular random reads, are very, very expensive. And to some extent, that is certainly still true of SSDs because of their asymmetric properties in terms of doing reads and writes. So what we're really doing is we're transforming a few random writes into many sequential writes, which is just better for the world in general. Um, and when you're doing a query, what we'll do is we'll go to one place in the database and pull out the specific timeline for that particular user. So the amount of work we have to do at query time is much more manageable. And this is absolutely key as your data set volumes grow. There is no way that you can answer queries uh, in a timely fashion as if, if it has to touch every element in a potentially uh, multi-terabyte, multi-machine uh, uh, data database environment. So um, the interesting thing about uh, denormalization in that sense was we were basically organizing the data that we collected into a structure which we could return. So if you think about it, we're not really, um, we're not really organizing the raw data, which is the fundamental building block of the, query, of, of the sort of queries. We're actually taking apart the data which is gonna be the, the part of the response. We're not collecting the input data, we're actually collecting the answers. So um, one interesting characteristic on which, which is shared by a number of these uh, emergent NoSQL systems is the notion of distributed counters. And counters are really the building block upon which all, uh, all of NoSQL analytics is, 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 is built. And I guess the reason for that is they allow you to take um, to, to, to almost use NoSQL systems as a storage system for the small components that make up the answers that you want to, that you, that you want to um, serve back to, your, uh, back to your users. So if you think about what would happen here, we would say, okay, um, I, have this, I have this tweet, but what I'm looking to do is potentially count impressions on it. Um, I want to be able to see the number of people that received it. I want to look at reach. And what I'm really inserting into an analytics system is not the tweet itself, but just a bunch of plus ones. So say I want to count the total number of tweets or divide, break down the tweets by day. Um, I'm really inserting counts, just, just, sim just simple counts. And that's interesting because when I come back to do a read on, 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 this, uh, on this data, um, I can just pull out a single number. So if you have used Hive over Hadoop and collected tweet stream data and then asked it how many tweets are in your Hadoop cluster, that can take a little while. And the reason for that is that you're, you're not giving Hadoop any context in advance that that is a query that you might like answered. However, when you're building 
uh, analytical applications, it's very, very common to know the pattern of accesses that you're going to be requiring ahead of time. So uh, I'll come on to show you how Twitter used exactly a system like this to provide advertising analytics. Um, and by thinking, by using the techniques of denormalization, you can provide a better ex uh, experience for analytical applications to your, to your users. So as I mentioned, this, uh, these sorts of uh, features are present in a number of different uh, NoSQL databases. So Cassandra has had uh, atomic counters for a while, uh, as has HBase. Uh, React has just added them in, in V1.4, uh, which is, I think, the latest release. Uh, Accumulo has them as well, and, and probably, probably others. Uh, they're a very useful, very useful building block for a wide range of, uh, wide range of analytics. So, in fact, the, the Cassandra implementation of distributed counters was uh, built by the community, but with substantial contributions from Twitter, with particular application to one of the, uh, one of the solutions they were building around providing uh, analytics to their end users on promoted tweets. So here is a picture of a dashboard of a uh, promoted uh, tweets dashboard uh, from a talk that Twitter gave a couple of years ago about how they built exactly this sort of system using Cassandra. So you can see that everything here, the key observation is that everything in this uh, analytics application that they have built here is basically a count. So you're looking at the number of tweet impressions, you're looking at the number of clicks, you're breaking that down by date and by uh, user, you're measuring reach, and all of that is just quantitative analytics. You know, not complex machine learning, but just quantitative analytics. And that is a, that is a simple system that was built on top of, uh, on top of Cassandra. And likewise, um, you might have uh, read in the last, uh, last six months about a system that uh, Facebook has built called Puma, which uh, does a, you know, a, a relatively, you know, relatively similar thing, but this time built on top of HBase. So it's actually used to power Facebook Insights. Um, it gives information about how uh, domains and URLs are being uh, talked about on Facebook. And on the right-hand side, you can see a picture here of a system called ODS, which is um, a, a system called ODS, which is uh, actually an internal metrics system for Facebook. So the, Facebook use it to track all of the uh, all of the analytics uh, that are all of the metrics data that are coming out of the infrastructure, the hosts, and the uh, thank you, or the hosts and the, uh, the services and the applications that are uh, running all across Facebook, and they use them to uh, detect failures, correlated outages, and, and raise alerts on the back of. So you can see a picture of a, a heat map uh, highlighting various metrics coming back from a particular Java application there. And all of that is built just simply using, using these atomic counters. So, you know, to go back to sort of normalization and, and denormalization, um, everybody who's done a CS degree probably has the uh, Introduction to Database Systems by Chris Date book uh, lying dusty in their attic or somewhere on their shelf. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, the, the general opinion and consensus in the database community is that denormalization is a bad thing. You should not do it. But if you look around at the uh, large web organizations, in particular the organizations who've been pioneering systems that have been tackling the challenges of the, the so-called data deluge, these guys are all denormalization all over the place. All, they're all using denormalization all over the place. So what, what gives? Um, you know, I apologize to, to Eric Evans if he listens to this recording um, about uh, using this picture. Um, <laughs> I guess, the, I guess the key thing to observe is that um, with denormalization, you have some challenges, but it's literally the only way to tackle data sets where you want uh, timely answers and you're dealing with very, very large volumes of data and uh, you have some idea about the sort of analytics that you would like to, you would like to, uh, like to look at in advance. So there is a challenge with denormalized systems, however. 
remember the key tenet is what you're doing is uh, you're, you're thinking about exactly how your data is going to be accessed in advance ahead of the time that you put it in. So that's great. So you build something like Rainbird or like Puma, and then your boss comes along and says, actually, you know what, be really, the system's great. It would be really nice to be able to have this different dashboard. Um, and you think, OK, fine. Um, so how do we do that? Well, you, you're, you're basically back to writing uh, code to, in order to, to, to change your, your data model at, H, at the HBase or Cassandra or React layer and looking at exactly what you do with every event in order to maintain the right set of counters so that you can do the right reads. And that's, you know, that's quite painful if you come from a, a, a background where you're used to relational database technologies and the richness uh, of queries that SQL bring. I mean, SQL queries may occasionally be slow over large data sets, but at least you can do them, right? Um, the challenge now is that your boss's new dashboard entails you actually scheduling your development team stopping work and going to, do, uh, going to, to schedule that feature and, and build that. And worse, if your boss actually then says, you know what, I would really like that dashboard, but I would really like historical data in that dashboard. And you're like, well, you know, we, we collected the data. Maybe Even if we collected the data, I'm now going to have to rearrange the existing data in the system or update the contents of it to be able to provide that new view. Um, and uh, I guess then, just to add insult to injury, your boss is almost certainly to say, you know, this system is really great. I'd really love to be able to create dashboards myself. Uh, can it talk SQL? And <laughs> that's, where, uh, that's where it gets, it gets trickier. So um, there are big challenges with agility and uh, denormalization. So one, uh, one other um, related set of techniques that um, I guess have been around for a while, um, but that uh, Nathan Mars, who I think is talking at this conference as well, has written uh, a lot about is this so-called lambda architecture, where the idea is you use a batch layer and a speed layer to combine uh, ad, hoc ad hoc results and sort of uh, polish them up with real-time answers. So you can see, I mean, this is, a, this is a, 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 an in image drawn by a computer science grad student, um, links at the bottom, uh, of just a sort of simple uh, lambda architecture that uh, he put together for a project, you can see actually that it's pretty complicated. There are lots of moving parts in here. Um, it's not, a, it, it's not a, a new idea, and it's quite interesting that you know, back in the early 2000s, Google, for several months at a time, did not update their core search index, but actually put the flourishes of real-time answers on top of it by overlaying those answers. And that's exactly what, what this is suggesting doing. The challenge is that, in general, it's very hard to compose a batch uh, system's answers with a real-time system's answers and get something that's meaningful. Say we're trying to count the unique number of visitors, you know, do something very simple like Google Analytics. So my batch system is telling me, well, historically, we got 83 unique visitors. And my real-time system has counted 17. Does that mean you know, that there are 100? Are they unique? It's, it's, it's not always easy to be able to just simply combine those, those, those statistics. So, this is uh, an interesting architecture for certain uh, applications, but in general, it would be nice to have something which was somewhat simpler. So we, uh, as a company, have done a lot of work with Cassandra over, the, uh, over the, the, the prior years, and we worked in particular closely with, an, uh, with uh, a couple of telco, large telcos collecting call detail and event detail records uh, with a small organization doing visitor uh, analytics and advertising analytics and real-time A-B testing and uh, a couple of others. And all of them were really struggling to build these analytical applications on, on top of Cassandra. But Cassandra is nothing specific here. It could have as well have been HBase or any of these other solutions. And the challenge they were having was really just that this was, was just a very low-level low level primitive. They were struggling with the idea of denormalization. Uh, they recognized they needed it, but at the same time, they wanted the richness of SQL. So we, we ended up productizing. Uh, so that's really the genesis of the, the Acuna Analytics product, which I'll talk about very briefly. Um, we, what, we, what we try to do is give you the benefits of uh, rich queries, but in the spirit of denormalization. 
And we've done that by introducing, I guess, real-time OLAP-style cubes on top of uh, NoSQL environments, as I mentioned earlier. So the basic idea is that you define an aggregate cube. You give us information about what you care about seeing in advance. So maybe you're looking at a, a prox top, you know, trending hashtags, or perhaps you're counting visitors, or perhaps you're, um, you're measuring the rate of change of cool drops or uh, cool length in particular geographic areas, something like that. But you just basically create an aggregate and you give it a list of dimensions. So the dimensions that you're going to dice and slice it by. And those fundamental two pieces allow us to do a small amount of work as every event comes in uh, to update these cubes. And we do that work incrementally and continuously. So you've got a stream of data and we continuously update those cubes. So perhaps we maintain multiple cubes that are looking at different aggregates and sliced across different dimensions. Um, we also store the raw events for a couple of reasons. So the first one being that we maintain a mapping from those aggregates to the raw events so you can drill back down to the, to the raw events so you can look at the, the aggregates that contribute, the, the raw events that contributed to a particular aggregate. But I guess the key thing here is this is denormalization, right? This is giving you uh, exactly what uh, Rainbird or, or Puma uh, have done. But the point is that we also offer this query language which does as much as possible at query time. So we allow you to sort of compose these building blocks of lookups on these cubes with the sort of traditional or familiar concepts of SQL, like joins, halvings, order buys, uh, arithmetic operations on the aggregates, and so on. So I guess the thing to note here is that you get to maintain pretty rich queries, but uh, at the same time, those queries don't touch the raw data every time you need an answer. They touch the aggregate cubes, which we're building and maintaining in real time. So data coming in typically fe can feature within query results within fractions of a second, and uh, those queries themselves tend to take uh, milliseconds, tens of milliseconds. Um, and, you know, I, I won't well particularly on, on, on the further details. Oh, one further thing to say is that we, we have this drill down. But the point is, if your boss comes along and asks for a new dashboard, you can take those events and we can programmatically just backfill them across cubes that you're, new, you're, you're newly creating. So a new cube will always be up to date for data coming in from that point forward, and we can backfill that historic data store. So we're just sort of freeing you from writing low-level code that deals with plus ones and um, uh, building complex data models and managing that in Cassandra or HBase, and uh, you know, then also free you from having to write scripts if, uh, if you need to make that, uh, those cubes reflect historical results. So um, I won't talk much more about Akunu Analytics other than to say that we use Cassandra under the hood to store raw events and aggregates. Uh, we have integration with Flume and Storm. We also have a bunch of rich dashboards because the next thing, of course, our customers ask us is it's all very well being able to get these results, but how do I see them? How do I visualize them? Um, and uh, yeah, in fact, actually, how are we doing for time? So I've actually got a few minutes. So I will I will give you a quick uh, a quick demo in the interlude. But before I do that, I just want to sort of uh, talk about some of the some of the conclusions here. Um, you know, NoSQL was originally designed as a way of uh, allowing you access to semi-structured data, either from a data collection point of view or from a serving point of view. So the problem is when you're trying to build analytical applications on those systems that you can't have unplanned queries that touch all of your data. It just, doesn't, uh, it just doesn't work. So you've got a few choices in terms of how you architect solutions. You can either do analytics out of band, uh, so to go back to the, sort of, uh, the, person, the Google personalized search use case. That works very well and is a simple architecture if timeliness is unimportant. If you're not really that interested in real-time answers for the particular problem set that you're solving. Alternatively, you can use atomic counters, and they're a great way of pre-materializing quantitative analytics answers. And you get the great, the classic properties of NoSQL solutions. There you get high scale, high performance, and certainly with Cassandra, and you know, high availability, and maybe with some other NoSQL systems too. 
Um, the real problem is that you've got to think carefully about flexibility. You've got to think about how the goalposts are going to move in advance when your organization gets their hands on this great new thing that you've built. Um, the, a Lambda architecture is an interesting approach if you want to do some really complex analytics. So if your uh, problem isn't amenable to just counting, if you're d wanting to do natural language processing or uh, like complex data mining, clustering, recommendation, and you need a flourish of real timely, timeliness to those answers, a Lambda type architecture where you d use a batch process to, to um, build those uh, those results from a sort of historical data at rest data store and then elaborate on them with real-time answers is a, is a potentially good way to go. Um, you just need to think carefully about how you can combine in a meaningful fashion the real-time results with the, uh, with, the, with the batch results. And finally, if what you're really looking for is an OLAP-style cubing engine on top of uh, on top of the NoSQL environment, if what you're looking for is sort of SQL-like queries, um, but, you know, so nothing, nothing significantly more complex than SQL, um, but you do need instant answers, then Akuno Analytics could be a useful, useful building block uh, for that. So um, I'll just flick through to a, to a demo just to uh, just show you how, how some of these things can, uh, can go. Um, I guess almost certainly everything's on the wrong display. Okay, I'm just going to try a bit of monitor gymnastics mid-talk. Hey, good. So this is Akunu Analytics. So I've just got an, um, a, a, a node set up which uh, I've pre-built a, a, a table. Uh, a table has a bunch of dimensions which really say when you get data in, treat them, uh, treat those those particular fields in a particular fashion, and we have a set of cubes. So this is actually a sort of mock data set which was built on the back of uh, some work we were doing with the telco, as I mentioned in this example, looking at cool drop rates across uh, various geographic areas. So we had geolocated cool detail records, and uh, uh, they wanted an operational display of, 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 of how cool drop rates were associated with geographic areas and with, um, uh, and with cell towers as well. So, um, you know, I just, uh, I just built this schema from... Uh, f from this particular file here, this demo schema. So I create this table and add these cubes. But actually, you know, I can do this automatically. Uh, I can, you know, what you're, the, the alternative that you're thinking about here, right, is how do I, uh, how do, I do this in, uh, in my favorite uh, NoSQL environment? Well, here you can, uh, you can just, you know, take some events uh, throw them in there, and it will deduce the format of the table for you, and it will give you the option to also invent, insert those events using a backfill process after creating the table. Um, so I won't do that now, but I guess what I'll do is see if I can. Uh, am I on the right machine? Yep. Okay, so I'll start insert, just inserting some events, um, and yeah, we're getting some. That's good. So then I can go and do stuff like. Um, build a, uh, a cube. So tell you what, I'm just going to count the number of uh, number of events. Let's just show you the structure of those events. They just basically contain a latitude and a timestamp and a longitude and, and, a, and a duration. So um, I could do something like Um, and I'll group by latitude and longitude. I won't do anything there. Yeah, so the only challenge is that line is not the best fit for that. So what we've got here really is a table where we have latitude and longitude against count. And you can see, because we're just still inserting a little bit of data, we haven't, we haven't got much there. Um, but what you've, what you've got under the hood here is a SQL-like query which has where clauses and group bys and where you can build much richer SQL-like expressions. And there's a HTTP API underneath this as well. So you, know, you can do anything that you're doing here through an embedded, uh, th through, through your own application. Um, so I could then turn this into, say, a map. And uh, then I can add that to a dashboard. Um, a 
astute observers will have seen that San Antonio. And then I can just get that refreshing in real time as I'm collecting data. And one of the things that you can then also do is, uh, you know, I can, I can change that. I can add multiple series, but I can go and embed this. So we have a JavaScript library, which means you can take that and embed that in your own web application and get from JSON, you know, high velocity stream of JSON events through to displaying a real time geographic heat map in your own application within about, I think it's taken me about three and a half minutes so far. Um, and, you know, I mentioned drill down, I can click on one of these squares and see the original events that contributed to, to that particular aggregate down there. So, you know, this is a, this is a potentially useful building block if you're thinking about real time, uh, you know, SQL-like analytics on, on, no, on NoSQL and, uh, uh, and, and if uh, you really care about focusing on the continue, you know, focusing your time and your team's time on the development of your application rather than on building uh, what I would describe as an infrastructure component. Certainly bringing back to you the sort of richness of SQL, but uh, allowing you to leverage the scalability, availability, and performance of a NoSQL environment. Um, so, a couple, couple more things. Um, you know, we talked about cubes. And we have some nice Rubik's cubes, which are uh, flying away like hotcakes, I think, on our stool. But come along, we're in booth six, and, and take a look. Um, you can also, one of our engineers is also quite good at these Rubik's cubes. So if you can guess the, number, the amount of time it took them to solve one, um, you can win an iPad mini. Just enter your name into the drawer. And I think actually one of our, other, our customers, Halo, is also talking a bit later on. Um, I think it's at 10.30, but I've lost the details. Uh, it could be 10 o'clock. 10.30, so talking at 10.30, uh, the, it's a Halo or an Axel funded uh, mobile taxi app. They use a whole range of uh, really interesting technologies, including Cassandra, uh, NSQ, Anakunu Analytics, and they're gonna be talking about how they built their architecture for scale because they're, they're growing very, very rapidly. And Akunu Analytics is a big part of that in terms of monitoring both from the infrastructure uh, side uh, all of the metrics that are coming in in terms of very low level, uh, low level system components right up through to business KPIs. And uh, they'll, they'll, they'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, thank you. So I think we've got a few minutes for, for questions. Hi. Uh, no Sorry, actually, just a second. Have we, have we got a microphone that we're bringing around? Or? OK, I'll, I'll just repeat your question back. Self-service, how far do NoSQL databases go in supporting self-service analytics? So in terms of um, BI tools, you're, you, you mean? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's certainly a big area that lacks at the moment in, in, in this world. I mean, one of the breaks, one of the, one of the I guess, consequences of moving away from uh, a single standardized, well-supported language like SQL to uh, more domain-specific interfaces which on the one hand, allow you to sort of break the assumptions, transactional assumptions of SQL and get scale, um, but on the other hand, mean that you don't have SQL anymore, is that none of the tools, and the visualization tools, the BI tools, the ETL tools, uh, the integrations with data warehousing, all of those things that you were used to just no longer exist. So from a SQL point of view, there, from, from a NoSQL environment point of view, there are relatively few. Um, not many BI tools uh, can, can directly access data in, in, in NoSQL environments yet. Um, so that would be, I guess, the sort of self-service side of things. Um, it's worth saying that there are other systems which do support a more relational database style of normalized queries. So MongoDB, for example, has an interesting aggregation framework which works in a similar way to or takes a similar approach to a traditional relational database in that it gives you a rich set of queries on semi-structured data and builds indexes and just without, without you having to predict or know anything in advance about the queries that you're gonna uh, ask will allow you to, to, to ask relatively rich queries over that data. Um, however, that obviously comes at a, a cost in the sense that um, aggregation queries in Mongo are typically broadcast to every node in the cluster and not always, but, but mostly, 
and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll end up you know, having to touch a lot of original data to be able to get answers. Unfortunately, there's no free lunch in, in that sense. Thanks. Hi. No. So every event that comes in, in Akunu Analytics, we, what we do is we look at the event, uh, we look at the cubes that we have, and we make a number of writes into Cassandra to maintain our material, essentially our materialized, denormalized views. Yeah. Exactly. So what we are is basically a layer over this distributed counter system. So you can think of us as, if you come from a sort of you know, Cassandra or H-based world, you can think of us as basically handling all of that data modeling for you. So you just say what high-level sh shapes of queries you're interested in, and we'll do all the data modeling. We'll build the queries, uh, we'll build, build the, the, the structure of the data that we maintain in Cassandra, and we'll access it directly. So Kuno Analytics is really just a mapping from events into writes into Cassandra, and from queries into reads on Cassandra. But from that, we can compose up a pretty rich, a rich set of queries that you have. But it's, um, you, you, know, you can use the standard operations tools to, to back up and restore, for example. Thanks. Hi. Do you, do you mean in Akunu Analytics specifically or in any of these systems? Okay, so we, so we, we support, sorry, the, the question was, um, thank you, yes. Uh, the question was, how is security addressed in Akunu Analytics? So we have, um, uh, so, so Cassandra itself has a number of ways of uh, securing the uh, encryption, so, so securing the communication channels between Cassandra nodes uh, and between Cassandra and, it, and its clients. Analytics is essentially a Cassandra client. Um, and you can go further with, so Datastax Enterprise, which is a, a great distribution of Cassandra, has uh, encryption, or actually supports on-disk encryption as well. Um, Akunu Analytics supports, uh, facilitates you having uh, client-side authentication. And in the upcoming release in a few weeks' time, we will be adding role-based access control on a per-table basis for, uh, for uh, Akunu Analytics. So the step after that uh, on our security roadmap is to actually allow you to um, have access control on a per where clause granularity. So you can set up individual users with access to specific uh, values, individual values in a where clause. So that's great if you have a bunch, you're storing a single, uh, you, know, you have 100,000 customers and you've got a mapping from wh who's allowed to see which customer's data and you, uh, want to be able to store all of that in a single in a single cluster. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, Lambda architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, where does your um, product match to that, or is it actually? Yes. Yes. Yeah, good question. So how does the Lambda architecture relate to Akunu Analytics? So the Lambda architecture from the picture, the diagram that you can see up here, consists of really a batch layer and a, and a speed layer. So the batch layer is, is, the, is the line at the top around Hadoop and batch views. And then the speed layer is the piece at the bottom where you take a stream of data into something like Storm or S4 and uh, then build real-time views. And then when a query comes in, you sort of combine the two. So Kunu Analytics is uh, basically just a richer speed layer. So you, Akunu Analytics, would, you would strip out the whole thing at the top. Uh, you would have um, Akunu Analytics being the, the, being the speed layer, basically. The first step is Akunu Analytics. Then the real-time views are maintained in Cassandra. So they're persisted. So you've got them despite node or data center failure and so on. And you can also got continuous access to historic results. So I guess that's one difference is that when you come in and ask a query, there's no difference in Akuna Analytics between data that arrived only a few milliseconds ago with data that arrived weeks ago or months ago. So very often our customers are doing uh, comparisons with historic baselines. Has the you know, investment banking, has the volume of trades, um, 
has the volume of trades that we're seeing right now uh, reduced or increased by more than sort of two standard deviations over what the particular volume is usually for this symbol on a Tuesday morning at this time. So that sort of historic baseline is used to be able to understand whether there's an outlier or an anomaly. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're basically just the, the bottom line. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I uh, miss, I didn't go into too much detail on that slide. So Kunu is basically three layers. So we have a, a Cassandra cluster. Cassandra is a great solution for uh, scaling out. It's a multi-master architecture. A single cluster can span multiple data centers. Uh, Kunu Analytics itself is scalable. It's more like a Cassandra client, sits on top. Um, and then you can just run, the dashboards are all client side. So just run in, in a browser. Um, and I think we are out of time. So uh, if you've got any more questions, please just stop by our booth. Thanks. <laughs>